name's Harry Jameson. I'm here to speak to you about longevity, the secrets to a longer, healthier life. Um, I'm basically going to dissect a load of the information that's out there. Lots of studies that lots of scientists far wiser than myself have done over the last uh, several decades. And then also sort of intermingling some of my own life experiences, some of my own professional experiences that hopefully will help us content and make the last 10 years of your life the best 10 years of your life. So, for those of you who don't know me personally or know who I am, my name's Harry. Um, my educational background is in sports science and psychology. So always really working uh, throughout my career with the understanding that the mind cannot do anything without the body, and equally the body is useless without a strong mind. So I think combining those two things, if your body is not the physical vessel you need it to be to take you where you need to go, um, it's going to be very, very difficult. Equally, if you don't have mental fortitude, strength, planning, a positive outlook on life, very, very difficult to achieve anything, even if you've got a great bod. Uh, I've had 15 years in the health and fitness industry. I know I look far too young to have achieved that, but uh, don't let this useful, youthful exterior fool you. Uh, I'm an old dog. I've been around the block uh, a long time, and I've hopefully learned a few things that I can, I can share with you guys today. So the first seven years of my career, thank you. The first seven of years of my career postgraduate, I spent on Harley Street. Harley Street's probably the biggest medical district in the world. Um, and I always made it my career, or my career goal, um, to bridge the gap between fitness and medicine. I don't think we do enough in this country. I think the Western world, the main problem is we have a very reactive, reactive uh, approach to health. Um, we wait for bad things to happen, and then we try to deal with them. People say, if you're going to see a doctor, it's already too late. I think fitness should be a tool, a preventative health tool, to help to stop negative things happening and help you perform better. Rather than waiting for something awful to happen to us and then zapping us with chemo, there's a 40-year build-up to those, that actually happening to you. And there was a lot that could have been done uh, in the process to, to optimize and maximize health. So that's where I see the future of the fitness industry. Uh, I hope that other fitness practitioners help to upskill themselves. Um, I'm not a doctor but uh, I, I have a good understanding of, of, of medicine and, and that physiological knowledge that you need to help to use fitness as, as a preventative tool. So I've always worked at the luxury end of the market. Harley Street is a very luxurious place, as is central London. So by default, I've spent a lot of time with a very uh, sort of high-achieving set of affluent, successful people. Uh, I'm currently based out of the Rosewood Hotel, a five-star hotel in central London. Um, we have a personal training studio there, we co-design menus for them, we run health retreats, we've got a really good team of, uh, of trainers and, and practitioners there who work with me. So I've just put these three key words here, uh, is it on both screens? Yeah. So I put these, these three key words here, lifestyle, wellness and performance. Um, fitness is a lifestyle, you are all here living the lifestyle of, of a fitness enthusiast, you're in a festival. Uh, full of fitness. We couldn't be, there's Lululemon leggings as far as you can see. It's become a way of life. It's not just nipping to the gym every now and again because you don't feel very good or just before a holiday. It's a whole way of living. Now, fitness is actually only a small component of wellness. I consider wellness to be far larger. How well do you digest your food? How well do you sleep? What are your energy levels like? Do you love your partner? Do you enjoy your job? Um, do you feel anxiety when you leave the house? Those, all those things make up how well you are. And how well you are and how well you lead your lifestyle will ultimately lead to your performance and how well you're able to, to, ta to tackle life. Um, I've, I've trained the founder of, uh, of one of the world's leading concierge companies, Quintessentially, for, for about 11 years. And there's a couple of people from Quintessentially over there. Well, she's, she's left Quintessentially to join the fitness revolution, which is a good thing. But by default, I managed to get my hands on client-wise some really, really high-achieving, interesting people internationally as a result of working with that network. Um, and living for longer once you've acquired wealth is something that everybody always wants. Often we acquire wealth at the detriment of our health. We work ourselves into the ground. By the time you've actually got time to spend your money, your body's given up on you, and that's never any good. It's a very Western problem, but it's very true. I write the fitness column at Esquire magazine. I've just started writing for The Times. Uh, and we run a health retreat, which is based on preventative health. We look at people's stress hormones and, and food tolerances. 
we were lucky enough to be out in the Maldives last year. Um, hopefully, we'll be back there next year. So this is a fantastic quote, and one I think we should all, all really learn from. I can never pronounce his name properly. Lucius Antius Seneca. I probably said that wrong, but luckily he died in 4 BC, so he's not here for me to offend him. But as long as you live, keep learning how to live. I think that's really, really important. I think there's a lot of people, a lot of phrases, live your best life, be the best version of you. That doesn't really actually mean anything. I think if you continue to learn how to live not only physically, what you put in your mouth and how much you move, but we'll, we'll learn throughout this presentation that there's also your mindset, how you view the world, the people you surround yourself with, has an enormous, enormous impact on, on how long you'll live, how healthy you'll be, uh, what your chances of developing disease are. So is there a secret? I think if you went into any uh, department store, the amount of products labelled anti-aging, um, are, very, are, are numerous. Are, there, are any of them proven? Do any of them make you younger? Do any of them, can you become physiologically younger? I think this is a question we're going to try and answer today. We're going to try and dissect some of the, dissect some of the, uh, uh, the science behind it, some of the experience, some of the opinion, and see if we can come up with a solution. See if we can learn something from the people on, on the planet who've actually lived the longest. Now, this all goes back, a lot of this goes back to the, the Danish twin study, and they decided that only about 10% of how long the average person lives is down to their genetics. So we've got to make an assumption that we've all got access to, to basic health care because that really is a, de a defining factor. Unfortunately, large parts of the emerging world, the developing world, the third world, don't have clean water, don't have good health care, um, don't have any health care. So the average life expectancy is quite short. But from that, we can infer that 90% of it is how you live. Once you're on the planet, you've got to decide how you're going to live your life, who you're going to lead it with, and what you're going to do with your body. We only get one body, we only get one mind. How can we, how can we maximize the use of both of them? It's all uh, lifestyle related. So the most fascinating study so far, and one that I highly recommend that you uh, go and look at the YouTube videos, listen to the TED Talks. There's a fantastic scientist called Dan Buettner, he, uh, him and his team from the National Geographic, some of the team were actually his, uh, his siblings, went around the planet to discover where in the world people live the longest. Where in the world there are most centenarians, you'll hear that phrase a couple of times, those are people who live to be 100 years old. And not only did they want to find the places that people lived a long time, um, not just people in isolation, but actual communities, but also communities that had good health. We're very good at keeping people alive in the Western world, but they're not necessarily functioning very well. These people had really low incidences of middle-aged mortality. Middle-aged people weren't having heart attacks in these communities. Uh, more people were living to be 100, and they called them the blue zones. The average life expectancy of, a, of somebody living in the blue zones is about 12 to 14 years longer than people living on the rest of the planet. And these aren't just 12 to 14 bedridden years, these are 12 to 14 amazing years. And you'll see some examples of some amazing 104-year-old women gathered around, drinking whiskey, having the time of their lives, um, and, and you'll see what, how they managed to get there. So these are the places. These are the five places on the planet um, where people live the longest, the blue zones. Now what you'll see is they're spread all the way across the world. And I'm going to address each one separately and... And what they wanted to know was, if I can find uh, some commonality, if I can find a thread where, where all these people across the planet are engaging in similar behaviours or similar rituals, eating similar food, doing similar types of activities, then I can, maybe I can discover some sort of de facto formula for longevity and I can bring that back to the rest of the world. Um, or, or Dan Butner wanted to bring that back to the States where everything has gone horribly wrong and people are, people are ill, people are dying, people are unhealthy, people are obese, people don't walk. Um, and he could start to rejig their communities. I think it's really interesting that we always have to sometimes have to look backwards to, to places that live a far more basic existence to find out how we and our modern lives should be living. So Okinawa in Japan, Ikaria in, in, in Greece, so I think we've, uh, we've lost it. So Icaria, um, and then Sardinia in Italy. Now, they put Sardinia in Italy. It's not actually Sardinia. Sardinia is a, a quite a big island. There's a one and a half million people who live in Sardinia. This is a very small, remote community in the center of Sardinia that live up in the hills. These are also kind of small communities who live within these places. 
Nicoya in Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California. Now, Loma Linda, California is slightly different because this is a small group of religious people called the Seventh-day Adventists who live in Loma Linda, California. The rest of California is doomed like we are doomed. If you've been to LA, you've sucked in that horrible smog, and you've sat in that traffic, you understand you wouldn't want to live to be 100. Now, these people, are, I'm going to address them slightly differently, uh, and we'll talk about them after. But if we focus on the other four, very, very similar in, in, in the way they live. They're very working class people. They're very rural in, in the terms of where they live. For example, the, the, in the Greeks, Ikaria, they live on a really small island that didn't really have a port, which actually meant they, could, they had to become completely self-sustained. So no processed foods, uh, none, of the, none of the trappings of the Western world. So what are the nine things? What are the nine, I'm gonna flick sort of back and forth a little bit between this side and the next. But these are the nine common things that were found in the blue zones that they all did. Now they're not just foods and behaviors. Some, it's really interesting and one of the main points I wanna get across to you is actually how you view the world and the people you asso excuse me, associate with, the feelings you have towards the planet and yourself actually massively affect how long you will live. So let's just address each point one by one and go through and see what we can learn. Now I'm gonna say something quite blasphemous at a fitness festival, but they didn't exercise. None of them, there wasn't a gym in sight. When I say they didn't exercise, what they didn't do was sit on their bums in an office for nine hours a day, then get on a tube, then go to Barry's and sprint till they felt sick, and then go home and drink wine. They had jobs that made them mobile. Now, if I just flick back to um, the, uh, Greece in Ikaria, they uh, were goat farmers. They were moving. They moved on average once every 20 minutes. They walked constantly, all the time. They were doing low-level, sub-maximal cardiovascular activity all the time. Chopping the lawn, pit, um, uh, getting the chickens out. Whatever they were doing, they were moving. Now, in Okinawa, Japan, they went to see a group of uh, uh, five or six women, this kind of girl pack, aged between 98 and 106 years old. And they sat on the floor when they talked. That's where they hung out. These women got up, up, and, off the f up and down from the floor from a seated position between 30 and 50 times a day, and they were 100. This is just naturally what they did. And none of these people are doing this on purpose. They're just doing this because that's, that's their way of life. Okay. Know your purpose. Now, I'm gonna tell you something quite depressing but quite good at the same time. These people always had a reason to get up and go and do something. The Japanese in the local dialect did not have a word for retirement. The idea that you would just stop doing stuff because you had loads of cash did not enter their minds. I think that's really important. They called it, their local phrase, your ikigai, your, your reason for being. Now, you didn't have to be a reason for being, have to be a job. It could be a person, it could be a, a grandchild, it could be to go and pluck fish from the river to go to feed your family. It had a purpose. Now, the two, statistically, the two years of your life you are most likely to die are the year you're born, and we've all made it through that, congratulations, and the year that you retire. Those are the two most dangerous years in a person's life. Once people no longer have a purpose, sometimes they... Um, they just stop. Physiologically, you stop. And, and I think that's uh, really important that we, we, we always make sure that, that there's a reason to do, why we do, to do what we're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Okay, so to downshift. What they did was they always made sure that they had time to relax. They took vacations. When they were working, they were working really hard. <coughs> Excuse me, but when they when they took time to meditate, to stop, to look around, to spend time with family, they always had time to switch off. They didn't live in a in a digitally connected society. They weren't constantly worried about emails. They weren't worried about waking up in the middle of the night and checking Facebook or Instagram. They had time to disconnect. Okay, so what food did they eat? Now, they had this really interesting um, viewpoint on on how much you should eat. Now there's a 30 minute disconnect between your stomach and your brain that tells you when you should stop eating. 
So they all stopped eating with about 20% left to go. Now it's really easy to continually overeat. I don't stop eating until my body is about fit to burst um, because I like food and I stuff it in and I keep going. I sometimes eat quicker because I know I can get more in and that's because I'm greedy and I'm Western and I'm not from uh, a small island in Japan. What they did was they took very, very small portions and they always stopped when they felt they could eat a little bit more. Now some of it's an economic thing because they didn't have loads, they didn't have an abundance of food but they did never over ate. They ate a predominantly plant-based diet because they were self-sufficient and they grew their own foods and they caught their own fish and they, and they killed their own animals. Now they weren't all vegetarians, but they were, they were predominantly plant-based. So that any food that came to them was not imported, was not processed. The like really key take home is if you're a meat eater, I'm a meat eater, um, you have to look at the provenance of your food. There was no um, meat injected with steroids. There was no battery farm chickens. There was all fresh. It was all grown. They made their own unleavened bread. It was all, all very much uh, sustainable, a sustainable way of life. <coughs> now, those of you who know me will know that this is my favorite news I heard when I was researching this, is they drank a glass of wine every single day. I love wine. And now I know why I love wine, because it's what's going to keep me alive. Now, I'm going to go back to that in a minute. Uh, it wasn't necessarily just wine that they were drinking. And I need to be very clear, they didn't save up all of their units for Saturday, hammer them down, and then feel like crap on Sunday morning. Um, they sustainably had a little sip, a little glass. And it actually turned out to be the, the uh, fermented, the way that the alcohol was fermented. Uh, the Japanese women were actually drinking whiskey. I love the fact these 100-year-old women just sit down and shot whiskey. Um, but it was that they have massive amounts of probiotics, polyphenols in the, in the wine, which is actually amazing for your digestive system, amazing for your immunity, amazing for your, to build a robust, um, a robust immune system. And then the belonging, their sense of how they viewed the world and how people viewed them. Isolation kills people, we know that. Um, and then what we were looking at was, <coughs> they created a healthy social network. So I'd just like to see a show of hands, please, as to how many of you today came with a friend. Okay, I'd like you to turn to that friend. I'd like you to thank them, because they might have just put a couple of years on your life. So what you're doing is engaging and encouraging each other to engage in healthy social behaviours. You've come together to come somewhere to help each other. Unfortunately, statistically, if your two best friends are obese, there is a 150% higher likelihood that you will also be obese. If your two best friends are fitness fanatics who've dragged you here, then thank them. Because it's very, very, very important to see who you associate yourself with, and that will have a massive, massive, longer-lasting effect on, on your life and your health and the chances of living longer. <clears throat> now, they were all quite heavily religious, and I found this to be a really uh, amazing statistic, that if you're a member of a faith-based group and you meet at least four times a month, you have the average life expectancy is between four and 14 years longer than those people who don't. Now, I, uh, I believe in God, but I'm not a particularly religious man, and I'm sure that people would tell you that, that God was keeping them alive, well, what they found from a sociology point of view was that it was the coming together, the support network. If my, someone in my family is ill, I have someone to talk to about it. I have people who share the same belief system as me. I have support around me. I think we've lost a lot of that, uh, religious or not. And the last point we really, really have, which is prioritizing family. The elders within these communities were really, really respected and revered and held very close, just like this woman. Now this is a picture of a 104-year-old lady and she is holding her 18-month-old great-great-great-great-grandchild. There are five generations between these two people and when asked what her ikigai, her purpose was, she replied to look after and nurture and nourish her grandchild. This was her reason for being. It's called the grandmother effect. There's less incidences of child uh, illnesses in all of these communities than there is in the rest of the world. I think we need to keep our elders closer and respect them more than we do. And look how happy the Seventh-day Adventists are from Loma Linda, California. 
These are the group of people who, uh, who were found in America <coughs> and the group of people who had more centenarians than anywhere else in North America. Now, they were very strict in, in their religious views. They observed the Sabbath, which meant they downed tools for a long period of time over the weekend, and they didn't do anything but meet together to pray, to, uh, to embrace each other. But one of the really interesting things is look how ethnically diverse these group of people are. It has nothing to do with their genes. There are black people, mixed race, there are Asians, there are Central Europeans, um, there are, there are uh, North Americans. They're all mixed in together, and it is the fact that they are, are walk everywhere, they use their bodies, it's, uh, are seen as temples, and they have an amazing, strong, positive outlook on life and a support network that helps them. <coughs> now, my favorite slide, the benefits of drinking wine. Um, it's a bit of a bold statement there. I know that one of them says it will make you sexier. I don't know if you get sexier the more wine you drink or if it is the polyphenols, hopefully, that help to act as anti-aging boosters. Wine drinkers will live longer than beer and spirit drinkers. And also, there's massive amounts of probiotics because wine is fermented. So it's a really, really good chance to, uh, to go and enjoy a glass of wine tonight after you've worked out and say that a personal trainer told you you should do it. Okay, so this is my friend Joey O'Hare. She, um, she owns High Mood Food. She's an amazing chef. You should go and check out her restaurant. It's actually in, um, just by Selfridges. And she says that polyphenols are like rocket fuel for the microbes. Red wine and dark chocolate are packed with them. So the good news is you should be eating dark chocolate. You should be drinking red wine if you want to live long and live happy. Now, the sauna. So we looked at... All, a lot of other people's uh, viewpoints on, um, on how, how, what will make you live longer. And we looked around and we looked at what other researchers have thought. But what about me? And what do I think? I love the sauna. I spend about 20 minutes every day in the sauna. My wife berates me for my sauna use for a couple of reasons. She told me that I was lazy and I, shouldn't be, I should actually be working. And she told me that it would fry all my sperm and we'd never be able to have a baby. Now, she's in the front and she's six months pregnant. Boom. And so not only am I proving her wrong on that front, but I'm also adding a few more years to, to my life and hopefully living a bit longer. Now, there are lots of reasons why the sauna is good for you. Um, not just because I say it is and just because I like hanging out in the sauna and getting a release of endorphins and having a sweat. It's actually scientifically proven. There was a woman called Rhonda Patrick, who is an amazing uh, scientist. And Rhonda Patrick has done loads of cool uh, YouTube videos and, and podcasts with Joe Rogan. And she's got some really interesting stuff on intermittent fasting. <clears throat> and they did a study in Finland. Another sauna fact is there's more saunas in Finland than there are people. Um, they did a 20-year study of men between 50 and 65 when they started the study. Now, what they did was they compared people who only used the sauna once a week versus people who used it more. And they, they found out the men who used the sauna two to three times a week had a 24% decrease in all-cause mortality. That's a 24% decrease in dying from anything other than an accident. That's massive. Men who used it four to seven times a week actually had a 40% decrease in all-cause mortality. Um, that is, I can't really impress on you how, how enormous that is and, and, and the reasons why we'll, we'll try to figure out in a minute. Is a sauna as good as a steam room? Actually, no. Uh, steam rooms aren't as good because they don't get as hot. They're good because they expose you to heat. However, saunas are ste seen to be better. And the reason why it's better is because it raises your heart rate, just like doing submaximal cardiovascular activity. So you can go somewhere between 100 and 150 beats. It's actually quite high. Um, and so you're having the same effect on your body as you would if you were doing, if you were doing cardio. Now, what about your mindset? How you feel about life? How you view situations? How you view other people? What impact does that have on how long you'll live? Do miserable people die sad? And do happy people live in ignorance forever? Maybe. Now, I don't like to put loads of, uh, loads of text up on the slides. But there's actually been a couple of studies done around this. I'm just going to read this out to you. So there was a research in the University of Pittsburgh that looked at rates of death and chronic conditions amongst participants of a women's health study initiative which followed 100,000 women aged 50 and over since 1994. So what they were looking at is, does your view on life have the, ch 
affect whether you'll become ill or how long you'll live. And what they found was that women who were optimistic, those who chose, <coughs> those who expected good rather than bad things to happen were 14% more likely, uh, less likely to die. I think that's amazing. Less likely to die from anything, but 30% less likely to die from heart disease uh, from eight years following on from the study. They're also less likely to have high blood pressure, diabetes, or smoke cigarettes. So actually having a positive outlook and really thinking good things will happen really does affect you. And that's a, that's a big study. That's 100,000 people. Dr. Hilary Tyndall. So how do I view sort of immunity and, and, and what do work do I do with my clients? So I, I, be, I believe a lot in stress resilience. I actually gave a talk um, about it on Friday. Um, building up your, your body's ability to cope with and deal with stress is one of the key factors in being able to um, boost your immune system and improve your performance. So we need to understand what, what does stress do to the body or what does negative stress do to the body when you're in this heightened um, parasympath parasympathetic state. If I can explain it a little bit more, um, sort of less sciencey, but it's when your fight or flight response has been initiated. When your adrenaline starts pumping out, uh, when you are ready, primed and ready to go, we, we should be in that state sometimes. We need it for performance, but not all the time. You shouldn't always be worried and always be stressed. Because what that does is it means you release too much cortisol and it disrupts your HPA axis. For the scientists in the room, that's the hypothalamic, um, pituitary and adrenal axis. It means your stress hormone production is all messed up. And that is bad for you because it shuts down your digestive system. So if you are constantly primed, if you're someone who's anxious, if you're somebody who's, whose stomach starts to get into knots all the time, someone who can't sleep, somebody who is starting to suffer from those things, it will lead you to having poor sleep quality, increased susceptibility to infections, and things like anxiety and depression can become far more prevalent. So in order to boost your immunity, and if these things happen, you're far more susceptible to disease, i.e. you're not going to live as long. So managing stress is a really, really key, key thing that, that I would try to get you all to, to, to look at. Meditation is one of the key management tools of stress. One of the best ways for you to, um, to, to cope with it, to, uh, to increase your endorphin production, to get into a more relaxed state. How many people here meditate? Okay, good, a high, a high percentage. And this is just my own personal ethos, and I'm sorry if I'm flicking through these a little bit quicker because I've only got a couple of minutes left to go. Um, but this is just what I do, and I should have put work in there at some point. But I eat, I work out, I rest, I go home to the people who I love and spend time with them, and I try and repeat that process as often as I can, as consistently as I can. Um, and hopefully it's, it's going to lead to good things. Um, and I think it's the best way to put yourself into a position to not only live long, but live happy. Take some time to observe the beauty in the world. There is a lot to be said for emotional state recovery and ha that having a really good uh, con contribution to your body's ability to fight disease uh, and, and live for longer. Now, this is a fantastic quote and one that I'm going to leave you with. I feel sexier at 104 than I did at 103. What an amazing woman. Marge Jetton from Loma Linda, California, uh, one of the seven-day Adventists, one of the people who I think we could all learn a lot from. Um, you can all follow me on Instagram. I'm trying to respond to as many people's uh, direct messages as I possibly can. Um, it's quite hot up here. I feel like I'm about to faint, to be honest. So I'm sorry if I skip through that last little bit a little bit quickly. But um, yeah, at Harry Jameson PT, thank you very much for listening. And I believe we might have time for, for like one or two questions.